have you seen energy lately? And if not, and you probably haven't, have you seen Mars? I'm sure you all use these concepts and terms every day, probably for the rest of your life. You talk about them a lot. But have you ever asked yourself, do I really understand what energy means, what mass means? Typically, the more you think about it, the less you understand. But at least we have names for these things. In fact, naming the unknown makes us feel better. We're more comfortable. And physicists are just human beings too. We do the same thing. So when there's something we don't understand, we haven't seen before, the first thing we do is give it a name. And we can start talking about these things. You probably know from high school things like these weird alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. He just took it from the Greek alphabet. No better idea what to do with it, so that's what we did. It still sticks around, in fact. <laughs> Recently, there's these weird things like dark energy and dark matter. Sounds scary. Sounds very impressive. Get a lot of funding for it when you write applications. <laughs> But naming you should not confuse with understanding. And this is an approach we often take in life. We just get comfortable. We use it so much, these terms so much, that we just get comfortable. But then we forget about asking ourselves, do we actually understand this thing? And that's not just in physics. So one of my pet peeves is attention deficit disorder. So now you can label people but you might have no clue what's wrong with these patients, if, in fact, there is anything wrong with them. So in physics, if we say we understand something, we mean that we have a theory for this. And not just that, we also have a theory that can be validated. In fact, we have observations, and hopefully this theory is good enough to explain all these observations. So that's when we say we have a we have an understanding in, in physics. In fact, that's the whole point. So you, could, you might as well say, if you have a theory, which might sound good, but you can't validate this, you can't test it, it's arguably a useless theory. So then what happens in physics is we build a valid theory. And then keep our fingers crossed that no one comes along and finds something unexplained or discovers something new well, in fact, maybe it's a good thing because that gets us, gives us new, new, a new job, a new, new work to do. And the most fascinating thing is you can sometimes just sit in your office and don't even look out there. Just think. It's called a thought experiment. Gedanken experiment in German. And people have used this a lot. And you can come to new conclusions. Just out of the blue, if you like. And then what you have to do is, and that's the hardest part, you have to come up with a new theory that explains all these things you just discovered. So either you revise the theory you had, so that's one thing, just fiddle around with it a little bit and can make it, that can make it work. Sometimes it's revolutionary, that's a bigger step. And if you're really lucky, at least that's what I think, that's the exciting part of a physicist, what comes out of it in a new theory, but in addition, sometimes we postulate new unseen things. Things we don't even knew existed. So we postulate them. That has happened many times in history. And this is, for me, one of the most exciting things of being a physicist. And then hopefully, of course, the point is now, to validate this. This can sometimes take 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You all heard about the Higgs boson that was discovered lately. It took 40 years or so. We built a big machine. We found it. God forbid we hadn't found it. So when we say in physics we see something, that has to do with observations. So you have to be careful when you say, I think I, I saw something the other day. As a physicist, it means, well, you have to observe it somehow. The question is, what does it mean to observe? So usually when you observe something, we think of ourselves as being outside entities. So we have nothing to do with this process. We just observe it, we just see it. But this thing is going on anyways, whether we're around or not. And this is too, uh, quite typical for certain things, like, like I just mentioned, the Higgs boson. So this is a particle, that's an elementary particle that was discovered and was postulated, because if it exists, it explains why lots and lots of elementary particles have mass. So yes, we found it. 
So when you're here in the media, we found the Higgs boson. In fact, what happens is, we didn't find the Higgs boson directly. No, 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 the Higgs boson is only around for a very brief time. And then it decays in other sorts of particles. So we actually never see the Higgs boson. We just see the outcome. It decays in other things, and those things we observe. And then we have a theory. We say, OK, because of a theory, the Higgs boson must exist, because we see the outcome we predict. But we don't see it directly. It's very important. Similar things, these gravitational waves. It sounds fascinating, of course. So they have been predicted many, many decades ago, and these are um, it's a phenomenon in the universe. So if large, large masses rotate and move around, they can create what's called gravitational waves. Well, what are these things? Well, turns out we can't see them directly. In fact, we haven't even seen them yet. We might be close, but we're not sure. So what happens is, if such a wave passes a bunch of objects in the universe, could be a bunch of stars, obviously, for instance, or planets, then it sort of shakes the space-time around these guys, and then the relative distances of these objects changes. And so what we actually observe is the relative change of the distance between these objects. That could be caused by anything, if we ever see it. But of course, we think it's going to be gravitational waves. And if they shake the way that we predict they should, then we conclude, yes, these things exist. And then there's quantum mechanics. Well, that's very different. So there, the story is that we're no longer an outside entity. Quite the opposite. We're not part of it, of the experiment. It's a very strange concept. So to observe something in quantum mechanics, you have to measure a system, but you can only do this when you interact with the system. But it gets worse. When you do this, you change the system. You have no choice. You will change the system. In fact, you, in fact, you must to observe it, to, to observe something. So that's a very strange thing. So because it becomes philosophical, do I really want to interact with the system? Philosophically speaking, right? I must change it. Do I want to change something? Yeah, so it might be similar, say, if you have a patient, if you're a psychologist, you have a patient, well, maybe at least at the beginning you would like to keep this person as they are, but to find out things, maybe you change the person in, in what you do. As a physicist, you don't care about it, of course, we just do it. <laughs> yeah. We just measure things. So then things behave very strangely. The quantum world is a very strange world. So it turns out that the particle, as some of you might have heard, can travel along two, two different paths at the same time. How is that possible? We, we don't really understand that, but it, if we, we can describe it, and it works very well with our theory, but we don't understand it. If we don't observe it, it can do that. If we look at this thing, it chooses one path, as if it knows that we observe it. It's a strange world. But we describe it very well, and we can build things like transistors and so on and so forth. So we're very good at this. Now then, of course, is the big unknown and the big unseen, and that is when you often hear that 95% of the universe is still unknown to us. What does this mean? Well, well, some people say that modern physics is all about gravity. Why is that? Well, gravity, as you probably know, is the force we know for the longest time. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years. In fact, since we've been around, we know gravity, I'm sure. And, le and yet we understand it the least. So in the in the, t in the terms of quantum mechanics, you would say we have no quantum mechanical theory for gravity. That sounds a bit nerdy, but it's true. <laughs> but you can also look at it a different way. So there's, in fact, in the universe, there's observations which are directly contradicting the way we understand gravity. The things you learned in high school, Newton and the apple, and the big G and the small g, right? They're not just like that. It seems to be different. So one thing is that the universe is expanding, yes, but it's worse than that. It accelerates its expansion, even though things are attracting one another. That's very counterintuitive. So when you observe this, there was a Nobel Prize a few years ago for this, for these observations. You think, OK, how is this possible? We don't know. Guess what? Let's call this dark energy. <laughs> well, we call the thing that explains the accelerating expansion of the universe, we call this thing dark energy. What it means, you can embed something in your equations by brute force that make things work. But we have no clue what dark energy is, you see? But it sounds impressive. Yeah. And then you can do something similar for when you, when you observe galaxies and the way they rotate. These galaxies, these spiral arms, they don't rotate quite the way they should. 
okay? The way we expect it from the way we understand gravity. So these spiral arms, especially on the, towards the outside of the galaxy, they don't rotate quite, quite as fast uh, as, as they should. Well, 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 what are we going to do about this? Well, we can do things like dark matter, right? So we can introduce another concept. We have no clue why this is the case. If we can find lots and lots of mass out there, we have no clue what it is. We stick it into the model, it works. But this dark matter is a problem because we can't observe it. It doesn't interact with anything except through gravity, but nothing else really. It doesn't seem like it anyways. Well, for that matter, we have no idea what it is. It works. Now, if you will do the following now, if you take this thing called dark energy and you guess, you estimate how much you need of that stuff to explain the accelerated expansion of the universe, and you take as much dark matter as you need to explain the rotation of galaxy, galaxies and such things, then you arrive at an estimate of about 95% of the universe is not known to us. So one of them is energy, one of them is matter, and they're equivalent, so you can convert it all to energy, it's 95%. So there's a lot left to be done. Can we explain it all? Okay, what do I mean by this? I mean by this, can we ever find a grand unified theory that explains the universe, its beginnings, the way things are now, and the way things will play out in the future? Good question. Here's the crucial point. We are no longer, for this experiment, no longer external entities observing the universe. We're in it. So we're trying to explain something that we're inherently part of. And there's two trains of thought, or two, two schools of thought. We can either do it or not. I think we can. But the problem is, we might have to observe enough other universes to have a large enough sample size for us to come up with a theory what this universe is, uh, how this universe uh, works. That might be a problem. But again, I'm a physicist. I believe we can explain it all, otherwise I wouldn't be a physicist. And I think pursuing this is one of the greatest endeavors in this universe. So therefore, my answer is, in theory, yes. Thank you.